Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you, I think this sound is on so you can hear me. Uh, first of all, welcome. It's, uh, it's a nice Monday at noon. You have something to eat or you have had something to eat perhaps. If you haven't, uh, if it's in your lap, uh, be careful but keep eating it. And I'm really pleased all of you are here. Uh, this is the Aspen Institute and this program is a separate program uh, under the umbrella of the Aspen Institute called the Center for Native American Youth. And I wanted to uh, invite you all here to make an announcement today of a program, a new program here at uh, the Center for Native American Youth that I'm enormously proud of and that I think will, like many of the things we have done, improve lives and save lives. And uh, so I'm really pleased that you're here for this announcement. I want to just, uh, if I might, introduce a couple of, uh, you're all important, but let me introduce a couple of people that should be introduced. <laughs> Kevin Washburn is the Ass Assistant Secretary for the BIA, Assistant Secretary of the Interior. Kevin, thank you very much. And, uh, new to his job, but was confirmed in record time by a Congress that can't seem to do anything in record time. Congratulations <laughs> to you. And uh, Charlie Galbraith uh, from the White House, working on Indian issues at the White House. Charlie, thank you. <coughs> Dr. Yvette Rubido, uh, right over here, the uh, head of the Indian Health Service, the director of the Indian Health Service. Uh, Hillary Tompkins is the uh, Solicitor General at the Department of the Interior. Hillary, thank you. <coughs> I want to introduce uh, Pam Gullison, who is a, a board member, uh, was a former Chief of Staff of mine in the U.S. Senate, uh, is now in North Dakota, but is a board member of this organization. Uh, and where's Pam? Right back there. <coughs> Pam just finished a race for Congress and came that close, but ran a great race, and her public service, I'm convinced, is not yet over. So, Pam, thank you for being involved in uh, the life of this country and the decisions we make, so I'm, and I'm really proud that you're on the board. I, I want to uh, uh, introduce Allison Benny, who was the Chief of Staff of the Indian Affairs Committee while I was uh, Chairman of that committee. Right here, Allison is sitting in the front. And then let me introduce uh, uh, Aaron, right over here in Bailey, and Josie and Jenny, who make up the, uh, the triumvirate that helped run this great program of ours. So let me, if I can, uh, and, and let me thank them for their leadership, especially. Uh, when I started this, it was my going to Aaron to say, I have an idea, and let's, let's move with this idea. And, and uh, with her leadership, she created this idea, created a nonprofit organization. I'll tell you a little about it. But I'm enormously proud of the ability to do that, uh, especially with uh, Aaron's help and direction. Um, let me just uh, mention a couple of things about how we did this. When I decided not to seek re-election in the Congress, having served there 30 years, uh, I decided I wanted to do some other things. And I had some money remaining in a campaign account. And the law allowed me to use that money in a unique way, not for my benefit, but it allowed me to uh, make a donation of $1 million to create a new organization called the Center for Native American Youth. And I decided that's exactly what I'm going to do because I've worked a lot on Indian issues in the United States Congress and I want to continue to do that. Where should I continue that work? Uh, best it seemed to me with the children, which is the future. And best it seemed to me with those who I think more than almost any other population in America have been left behind. Uh, many Indian children really have been left behind in terms of opportunity, and I wanted to try to change that. Working with parents and tribal organizations and others, uh, we have created then a nonprofit organization called the Center for Native American Youth. We're working a lot on uh, teen suicide prevention. The rate of uh, teen suicide is uh, quadruple the national average uh, for teens. We're working on education opportunity, uh, juvenile justice issues racial equity and child welfare issues, and, uh, among other things. So that's, that's what brought us to this mission, and it's, it's uh, what we're involved in. Now, I want to mention a couple things to you. We are at this center reaching out to Indian children. We did, I think, uh, over 50 roundtables with youth in Indian country in the last year and a half. I've been at many of them, not all, but many of them traveled uh, and uh, been involved in these youth summits. We are interested in... in uh, trying to understand how we, working with parents and with tribal authorities, can be helpful to change their lives for the better. 
this center is just committed to reaching out, and that's, that's most of what we are about. There, there is this old saying, bad news travels halfway around the world before good news gets its shoes on. All of us understand that, right? Well, the fact is, if you read, for example, the New York Times and you see the story about Indian children, you'll see it's a negative story about all that's wrong. All of us know that there is plenty that is wrong. But you don't see the story about the inspiring work some others have done. And it's very important, in my judgment, to recognize and hold up that inspiring work as evidence to others that you can do this too. <coughs> Almost anything is accomplishable or achievable. Uh, it's been done by some inspiring young people, and you can do it. That's why we decided to do something unique here and uh, do um, a, a program at the Center for Native American Youth called uh, the Champions for Change. And I want to tell you how this started because I was invited to the White House uh, about a year ago and Charlie Galbraith was involved and they created a Champions of Change and invited some Indian children to the White House, uh, young adults uh, in many cases. And all of them had stories that just made you hear those stories and look at these kids and say, oh man, th that is so inspiring. I want the <laughs> world to know what they're doing. Uh, some time later, uh, I asked uh, the White House and Charlie if uh, they would mind if uh, the Center for Nat Native American Youth adopted a program, Champions for Change, and did it yearly and institutionalized this so that we would be able continually to recognize unique and really new, interesting, positive things that are being done by children on Indian reservations across the country. And the White House and Charlie said, absolutely, we'd love if you would do that. So we're doing it. And today we announce a new program that we will initiate called Champions for Change. And you will, in the years ahead, see names like Tessa, for example, and others, and or White Sun, and many others who will become examples of what is achievable. Examples to you <laughs> and others of wonderful things that are happening. So that's what this program is all about. And uh, I, you know, I have, during these tribal summits, that we, youth summits we have done, I've met uh, people that I will never forget. A young woman named Grace from the three affiliated tribes, senior in high school. And I said, Grace, uh, what are your aspirations? What do you want to do? She said, well, I'm going to be a doctor. I said, really? She said, yeah, I had cancer when I was a young girl but I was cured. And I've decided that my life's work is to be a doctor. I'm gonna cure others of cancer. And by the way, she's now in college this year in pre-med. But you find these all over the country, unbelievably inspiring stories. You think somebody's gonna do a headline story about that? Probably not. But we're gonna make headlines with efforts like that and people <coughs> like that. And that's what Champions for Change is about. I want these to be headlines. So uh, we have a couple people with us today that I'm going to tell you about. Tessa Baldwin. Tessa and I have met before. Tessa is from Alaska, and you're going to hear her story. It is really an inspiring story. Born of tragedy, she'll describe what she went through and then what she did. Uh, I know how hard it is to create a nonprofit organization because we've done it in about a year and three quarters. It's really hard. This young woman in high school created Hope for Alaska, a nonprofit organization, and she's going to tell you about it. And then we have uh, Whiteson Yazi. I met uh, Whiteson at the Pine Hill High School on the reservation in New Mexico, and he told me a story. But I didn't know that story because when I went in, this young man was a student leader. He was the head of the student council, and he was the guy that did the talk, and he was the leader. But then as I talked to him, I understand that Whiteson came through some very difficult times but came out the other side and decided, here's what I want my life to be. I want to be a leader. I want to be a student leader. I want to set an example. And what a remarkable young man. These two are examples of what I have found all around the country. And then uh, uh, Patty Talahangva. I can't get by with saying you're in high school because they're not going to... Not that you, I can. Okay. <laughs> Patty's not in high school. But... But I'm going to tell you something. I remember. <coughs> I'm going to tell you something. I was at the Salt River Tribe in uh, Arizona, 
and we were doing a youth summit, sitting around meeting a, a bunch of kids, about 30 or 40 kids in a room, just talking about what's going on in their lives and things. And Patty, who's a, a journalist and a very accomplished professional, Patty told them a story that I've never forgotten, a story about her mother. I don't know her mother, but I will not forget her mother based on the story Patty told. And it, it's, it's, again, the kind of thing that is inspiring, and we wanted Patty to share her story today as well. So that's why we're here. Um, I think this is going to be a, a great opportunity for you to hear some remarkable things and then for uh, you to ask some questions as well. And I want to, uh, uh, Charlie, just before I invite the panel to begin some discussion, I just want to thank you for allowing us to do the Champions for Change and grab that brand and institutionalize it. I want to just invite you to say a word if you wanted to. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are obviously thrilled that uh, Senator Dorgan and Aspen Institute has taken this on. Um, one of the, the greatest thrills I've had at the, working at the White House was we, um, we asked uh, Indian Country to send us their stories for Native youth to tell us what they're doing in their communities to bring change uh, and build their own tribes and communities across the country. And we got over 600 submissions mm -hmm. and narrowed that down to uh, 11 champions of change who uh, were invited to the White House uh, and actually met the president uh, about a year ago. And one of the hardest things in the job was picking 11 people out of 600 stories that that we could have, you know, we probably could have had 580 stories uh, told. So to, to see this picked up by the Aspen Institute and carried on, uh, I think can be a, a great uh, legacy for the Aspen Institute, uh, but also something that will benefit all of us working in government, working in tribal government, uh, because the youth that we've been able to, to bring through the program at the White House uh, have come back to, to help us within the first year. My current intern was a champion of change from last year, and uh, now uh, we put him hard at work, so he's, he's grinding it out with the rest of the interns right now. Um, we had uh, the president mentioned uh, some of the champions of change in his speech last year, and we had um, one, of, one of the champions, Lorna Hermini Horses, uh, sing the national anthem at the Tribal Nations Conference in Lakota last year. So. Uh, not only doing things like this are we building up youth, but we're also benefiting uh, our work uh, both on, on the government side and it can apply to the private side and the private and the, the tribal side as well. So uh, with that, I would just like to again thank Senator Dorgan and the Aspen Institute uh, for picking up this Champions of Change idea. So thank you. Charlie, thank you very much. We appreciate that. And I, I do want to mention two additional things, and I'm going to call on Tessa first. Uh, first thing is um, thank you to the Aspen Institute for scholarship funds that they have participated in uh, providing to this center. They've been very generous uh, in, in uh, donating those scholarship funds. The Alaska, As Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, thanks to them. We appreciate very much your support as well. And Salt River Indian Community for their early support of this program. And I, I you know, the rule of thumb here is Never let people leave the room without asking for something. So I'm not asking for you a, from, from a contribution from you today, except that if your organization or you uh, would like to be a, assist this program, we have a website, Center for Native American Youth. Go to that website. It'll give you great detailed instructions on how to be helpful. So thanks to all of you for that. Now, Tessa. Uh, as I said, I have met Tessa previously at the White House. She is a remarkable young woman. She has done what very few have ever done as a teenager. She's created a nonprofit organization, as I indicated to you, born of some family tragedy. But boy, what an inspiration. Tessa Baldwin. Thank you. <laughs> so Tessa, can you um, tell them the story, the story that you told at the White House one day that uh, made Charlie and I very excited about your work? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm getting over a cold right now, so my voice is kind of raspy, but I'm from Codsview, Alaska. It's a town of a little under 4,000 people, which is kind of big for Alaska. <laughs> and um, I started a nonprofit called Hope for Alaska, which is a suicide prevention awareness campaign where I traveled around the state of Alaska every single week of my senior year, and I told my personal story about how suicide has affected my life and suicide has always been 
something that I grew up with. Um, my indie back name, Unalim, I was named after my dad's best friend who committed suicide. So since I was born, it's been in my blood, is what my family tells me. Mm. And uh, I haven't talked about this in a while, but <laughs> um, my uncle, who was like my father figure, committed suicide when I was five years old, and he was just someone that I really looked up to. <laughs> and so from there, I just knew that like I needed to do something for suicide prevention in Alaska because I knew I wasn't the only one being affected by suicide. And, you know, I grew up a little, and I went to high school, and I went to a boarding school, which is pretty common in Alaska, Mount Edgecombe High School. I just graduated this year, and... Um, I decided to start Hope for Alaska in the loss of my ex-boyfriend who committed suicide my junior year and he was really like the inspiration and motivation to create Hope for Alaska and I got some funding and decided to start traveling around and telling my story of how I was affected and how we could overcome this as a state. And Tessa, what did you find when you went around to schools and other places talking about this with kids? Uh, have most children, most kids um, your age had the same acquaintance with the, the devastation of suicide? Yeah, definitely. Um, I went to over 20 communities and uh, not one village, not one town that I went to um, I've had someone come up to me and tell me their story. I think by the end of the year, I had 156 untold stories about how suicide has affected their life. I held a couple of, I guess, three hearings on the issue of teen suicide, uh, one in North Dakota and two in Washington, D.C., and one of the things that I discovered is there were some who said, I don't, I don't think you should be holding hearings on this. I, I, that, that's a subject that's kind of negative. Let's not... Let's not be talking too much about it. And yet I felt, probably as you did, that we don't have a choice but to talk yeah. about this. What's causing it, and how can we try to prevent it? Did you right. have the same feeling? Yeah, actually, before I, start, before I started traveling around to schools, the elders in my village would look, at, look to me and say, why would you talk about this? You're going to cause our children to commit suicide if you talk about this. And uh, it was proven that if you talk about it, then youth would actually come out and talk to us about their elders. So it was, it's definitely the opposite, and I'm glad that we're becoming to overcome this. So. And did you have the support of your local school and your parents? And I mean, creating a nonprofit organization, Hope for Alaska, <laughs> at age, what, 17 or so, yeah. that's a pretty big undertaking. Did they say to you, well, I don't think you'd be able to do that. Uh, why would you, why don't you, why don't you just concentrate on your studies. Let somebody <laughs> else take care of this. Yeah, I definitely had those reactions. I, um, I think that's what really motivated me, though, was people didn't really believe that I could do it, and I decided to tell them wrong. So. <laughs> and uh, what kind of, did you get some uh, funding for your organization? I did. Um, October of 2011, I did a project where I put together like a plan for Hope for Alaska for the next five years and I was awarded twenty five thousand dollars. Good yeah. for you. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you. Well it's pretty unbelievable that you've been able to from the knowledge of tragedy that was very personal to you decide I'm not going to just grieve although grief is important, yeah. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to save the lives of other kids, improve the lives of other kids. And uh, I, I just, what you do inspires me. We're going to talk about what you do more because people will have questions and so on. But uh, and one, one last thing for you. Since <laughs> I've been involved in politics for a long, long time in a state that's very sparsely populated, mm -hmm. probably not quite as sparsely populated as Alaska, but I have run in 12 statewide campaigns, so you can imagine how much of driving I have done in a car <laughs> and so on. And so in Alaska, where you, you have done 30 and 40 presentations and so on, do you drive? How do you get around Alaska no. to do what you do? <laughs> uh, we have no road systems, so I had to fly everywhere I went. 
And I was, I was going to a boarding school at the time, so I would leave Sitka, which is southeast Alaska. If you look at my Alaska map <laughs> right here. <laughs> I, <laughs> you want to show the rest of them? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I went to a boarding school down here, and then most of the communities I went to were up here, and some of the flights that I went on were about six hours. Is that right? And yes. mostly small planes? Uh, yes, uh -huh. for the most part. Well, that makes it even much more important <laughs> what you did, flying around Alaska in small planes, going up north. To, uh, I, I just am so inspired, and congratulations yeah. to you, Tessa. I know that uh, you're a young woman. You, you are now at a college in San Diego. Yes. And my guess is your contribution to uh, Indian youth is just beginning, despite all of these magnificent accomplishments. So congratulations. <laughs> Now let me introduce you to a young man uh, named Whiteson Yazee. Uh, I met Whiteson at uh, a school in Pine Hill um, in, in New Mexico. He lives way out there. <laughs> let me just tell you, if, if you want to go visit him in, <coughs> in high school, he's, he's out there a ways. Uh, you have to go to uh, fly into a big city and then get in a car and drive about uh, two and a half hours yeah, or so. But I could tell when I met with the student leaders, I spoke to their school assembly, uh, and I was there with uh, Josie, who it's, it was her home uh, reservation, and Aaron was with me, and, and we, uh, we had some really good opportunities to visit with students. Uh, Whiteson was a student leader, head of the student council uh, at that school, and we talked a lot about things and about the challenges and about the difficulties one can encounter in life and how you how you get through them and so on and I wanted I wanted Whiteson to come and talk to us a little about uh, his life and and uh, the challenges he's had and the leadership uh, decisions he's made because it too is very inspiring and by the way um, his parents are here and uh, I'll introduce them after Whiteson completes his comments Whiteson <coughs> In Navajo, we introduce ourselves in our native language because it's based upon our clanship called, we call it Keh. It tells us who we are and um, um, who our family is. Um, that means, hello, my name is Watson Yazi. My clans are Chisha is Chirokawa Apache. Um, Tachitni is red running into water. The Klashcha is Black Streak Wood People, and Sinajini actually is, no wait, never mind. Sinajini is Black, Reek, Black Streak Wood People, and Klashcha is Red Bottom People. <laughs> um, Pine Hill is basically a small reservation, Raymond Navajo reservation. It's, we have a little over a thousand people, maybe yeah, just about a thousand people. Um, it's as you as the name sounds. It's a hill, <laughs> we'll find, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> there's basically ponderosas, pinyons, junipers, and you're a senior in high school there, right? Yeah, I'm a senior at Pine Hill High School, student council rep class, um, student body representative, and the student um, body our student council president. So um, You were a pretty big deal when I showed up. <coughs> yeah. All those, all those presidents. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it wasn't so easy getting there, right? I mean, you, you've no. had some real challenges. Yeah. Um, I started off my high school years in a preparatory school called, called Navajo Prepar Preparatory School. It's in Farmington, and it's about a four-hour drive from where I live. So I've commuted every Fridays from school, going home, and every only got to stay home like one one day, and then Sunday I'd go drive back up there. Mm -hmm. And transitioning from an urban setting, for like from a preparatory school back to Pine Hill, which is a community school, it's it was pretty hard. I had a lot of friends up there. I made some poor decisions, and with that. Um, I had, I know this sounds cliche, but I had two roads. One was bad, full of, like, um, what do you guys hear, stereo, the stereotypical teen, um, native teen, which is like substance abuse, alcohol. 
I had a choice to either go to that or the choice, the road I went with, which was to make it, to teach, tell, tell people about my story and how I've went overcame, overcame coming, um, overcame substance abuse, drugs, um, alcohol, and, um, and what 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 helped you overcome that? Because it's that that kind of bowl of despair that one gets into is very hard to get out of. And yet, you you were in it. You got out of it. You're a student leader. Uh, I was so impressed with you at the school and on the reservation that day. What what do you think were the things that helped you lift yourself out of that circumstance? It was my tradition, actually, the Navajo. We've from a, from a young age, we start off very disciplined and if you were to get out of, out of line um, they discipline you um, like just traditional disciplines I guess um, from um, my Navajo language is basically a foundation so if, if um, I, I don't know if I didn't know my language I wouldn't if I didn't know my tradition either or my culture I wouldn't probably be the man or the person I am right now so. Are there kids that were friends of yours who took the other trail? Yeah. And, and, w and what do you see from them? I mean, what, what, what results from that? Um, I, I have a lot of friends, actually, that, have, that are, that drink and use drugs, which, I don't know, just, uh, <laughs> um, their story is they were born with, or they had both parents, but when they, when um, my friend, for example, his mom, she's a single mother. She has no job, and she lives under government welfare. Which, and uh, he, he is a bright student. He has a lot of talent. He has, he's very smart, but he chose the wrong path. He. He does drugs, he drinks, and I try to tell him to stay in school, but yeah, he's often absent, often hanging out with the wrong crowd. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what we're trying to do, as you know, in the Center for Native American Youth is to try to find out what are the things that, that do work to try to help people and help lift people up. And I mean, your story is an example of that, y your story to your friends who've chosen the wrong path is a story that says there is a better way and there is an opportunity to succeed. I mean, you're, you clearly are a student leader with the respect of the student body. I saw that while I was there. And so uh, I know there'll be questions from others about uh, you and what you've done, but you're inspiring uh, and, and we really appreciate your coming and sharing your story. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>
And um, so welcome, you know, you're all welcome to come out to Hopi and visit. Uh, we have a wonderful culture out there, and as White Sun mentioned, oftentimes culture is, is key to uh, overcoming a lot of these issues, having that tie to culture. Uh, before I even begin my presentation, I would like to recognize my niece who is here today. And um, this is Lance Corporal Alexandria Smith. She is based here at the Marine Barracks in Washington. <laughs> And uh, she turned 19 last week. So I'm very proud of her service and uh, continues to carry on the strong tradition of military service in our family, uh, um, not just the Marine Corps, but Army, Navy, Air Force. So thank you for being here today. My uh, story, um, I have, when I received the call from Senator Dorgan, uh, first of all, I was shocked because I wasn't chasing him for an interview, and it's not usual a senator calls you <laughs> as a journalist. <laughs> so um, he uh, it described what this was about and described the effort to focus on youth suicide. And that's all he had to say. And I said, I'm in. The reason for that is I was 15 years old when my father killed himself. And it devastated the family, obviously. For in, in every way imaginable. So my mother was, um, she had six kids from 18 years down to three years old. And she decided this wasn't going to stop her, that now she needed to be the major breadwinner, whereas before she was the homemaker and she had worked at schools and such. So my mother, being in her 40s, um, turned around and went back to college and got her dual degree in English and art education. So inspired us, showed us, and no matter how hard it was, we ended up splitting up the family because when she went back to college, she couldn't afford a house uh, or, and there wasn't a lot of married housing on campus. She went to Northern Arizona University and she got a small apartment. It wasn't large enough for all of us, so two of us got shipped off to boarding school, myself and my younger sister. My older sister was in college, but we all knew that whatever happened, we would have to stick together and support and do our part because you know there are three of us who are semi older my sister who is 18 and then myself and then my younger sister but then we have what we call the three little ones in the family and taking care of them my two younger sisters and my brother and so she recognized that um, need to be have some kind of education and career where she could take care of the rest of the family so she went off to college and I'm very proud of her she not only graduated with her dual degree but she ended up going off and getting her master's degree and um, studying in Oxford, England. So she went there for two summers. And here's a woman who did not speak a word of English until she was eight years old. And she was forced to learn how to speak English. I grew up with words like clothing. She couldn't say clothing, the T-H. And so I thought that's how you say, you know, you're clothing, okay? We'd make out our list every year for school clothing. <laughs> <laughs> when the movie Dances with Wolves came out, I, I, I'm, I'm totally trashing my poor mother because she knows that about me. So she would say, Patty, I want to see that movie, Dances with Wolves. And I'd say, Mom, what's a wolf? <laughs> 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 so she's wonderful. She's still uh, teaching at a community college. And uh, she's my first teacher and my first inspiration. So understanding that no matter what, even though, and you know, when we talk about health services and the lack of, we were in an urban setting, but even in that urban setting and trying to go out to, whether it's contract health or wherever else, we never got the counseling that you should get when you're having a suicide in your family. Um, not only did my father commit suicide, uh, my cousin, who I adored and looked up to as an older sister, killed herself when she was 16. My cousin, who is the same age as me, took his life when we were 19 years old, and um, other relatives, other people. And every time you turn around and you see somebody taking their life, it just doesn't make sense. And you're left with all that is to be dealt with. So how do you make the choice to carry on? How do you make that choice to go forward? And I would say with you, what you're doing, um, you know, your friends may not understand that today, but they will in the future. And so it's important for you to continue being that good role model because you're going to inspire them, whether they like it or not. And they're somewhere down the road, they're going to go, wait a minute, you know, that's what he was trying to tell me 10 years ago. And that's the other effort is that we're patient and we not give up that hope. 
So um, we look at issues, uh, education, health care, and law enforcement too. I have a friend. I uh, started running last year competitively, and um, my friend who's also a runner was telling us about a story that when she was a little girl, she's Navajo, that she knew even as a little girl, eight years old or so, that it did no good to call the tribal police because they would not respond to her helps, to her cries for help when her father would come home <coughs> inebriated and, and harming her. So she would go to the payphone next to the police station to call her uncle for help. So looking at these issues, how can we really put some teeth into effort here to help our native youth? Um, they are, every generation has to help build the next generation and that foundation, that strong foundation for life as they mature. If we don't have that strong foundation, what kind of structure are we building? We're building a shoddy <coughs> structure, right? A lot of holes in there and such. So the health of our young people and then helping them overcome things that happen. And you know, we all face it. So again, how do you overcome that? How do you help out? So I'm here on the board trying to do my part, talking with uh, Aaron and Josie and Byron Dorkin. Patty, what, what do you think, <coughs> you know, your mother's circumstances are quite extraordinary. She loses her husband. And, and then decides somehow I've got to I've got to find a way to make a living and care for these children, and she goes to college, and gets a master's degree, studies in England. I mean that's a pretty extraordinary switch to turn on. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is more common perhaps to kind of sink into the the depths of despair, and and really never get out of it. I, I you know I've seen that very often. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, what, what is it do you think that triggers that? And the, the other folks in your extended family and acquaintance who committed suicide, were other families in some cases just devastated and never quite got their footing after that? Absolutely. I think two things. One, you have to always have that strong faith in yourself, that core belief in who you are and what you can achieve. And no one, you know, people, it is true, they talk negative, say things about you, you can start believing that. But deep down, you have to know who you are. And I think, again, that goes back to culture. That goes back to identity on who you are as a person. So she knew, first of all, she's a mother, she's responsible for all of us. And she took that to heart. So that was a big part of it. She was also a teacher's aide at the local high school, and she had mentors around her, people who were inspiring her. Yes, go back to college, get your teaching degree. You're already good in the, in the classroom and talking with students, so go back and get your degree so you can be a teacher and have more of a career as a teacher. So she had good mentors around her, good role models, good people and supporting her. Let me just tell you that, well, first of all, Patty, thank you. What, that's, that's such an inspiring story. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. And I, I, I did mention that Whiteson's parents are here. Where are you? Okay. Right over here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us as well. Now, if, if this were um, 200 years ago and I had started this organization, um, I'd not only be very old, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, my first choice uh, for the Champions for Change would be a young 16-year-old uh, woman named Sakakawea. Uh, she jumped in a keelboat on uh, April 7th, 1805, about 40 miles north of what is now Bismarck, North Dakota. Uh, she jumped in a keelboat with uh, Lewis and Clark to guide them on their journey to the West Coast. She was 16 years old and she had a baby on her back. And she is one of the heroines of that great expedition, one of the great expeditions in American history. And um, she is the best known person, person of any group of people that have ever lived in our part of the country. Her statue is in the Capitol building, the statue of Sakakawea, this 16-year-old young woman. Courageous. And you know this story about um, uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers and the famous dance team. They said Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did except backwards and in high heels. <laughs> well, Sakakawea did everything Lewis and Clark did, and she did it with a baby on her back. 
in that great expedition. Um, so youth, 16 years old or 60 years old, uh, however young one might feel, there's just a great opportunity, it seems to me, for us to do good things and then share our stories with others, and that's what you've done here today. What I'd like to do is open this up to some discussion, perhaps questions. Uh, these are stories that I think are very inspiring, and my hope is that every year the Center for Native American Youth will be able to lift up uh, and connect and show America that uh, there is more than just despair and stories about desperate conditions. Again, I mentioned the New York Times only because they wrote a story that I thought really wasn't very reflective of some wonderful things going on, and I wrote a letter to the editor to say, you know what, there's, a, there's another way to describe this. There are some real rays of hope out among these young people on Indian reservations, and I want you to know about that as well. So let's open it for some questions and comments. And uh, anybody here have any questions? Yes. Stand up and just shout out if you don't mind. I guess there's a microphone. Um, I just wanted to ask White Sun, with your new path, have you like taken on any community initiatives? Or you have any ideas or hopes of things you're wanting to do in the future? Yeah. Um, right now, since since I took the, I guess presidency, we've in the past months we've worked on projects like community cleanups. We've painted over graffiti on the community water tank. We've cleaned up the side of the roads and we are planning on making a, putting in recycle bins in our schools. Well, and while I call on members of the audience, I also want to mention that uh, uh, Kevin Washburn is here and, uh, and Hillary Tompkins and Yvette Rubido, and I, I want to invite any of you to say a few words. We have microphones here. If, you, if you'd like to make an observation, I'd be happy if you do so. And let me take one more from the audience and then go here. Anybody else? Uh, yes. <coughs> And my question for both of you, uh, actually three, all four of you, would be um, thinking about other tribal youth, what kinds of, what would be the next, what would help you take your leadership to the next level? What kinds of help would you like to see to get you to that next level in leadership? Well, this is long. <laughs> okay. I would really say creating more opportunities such as this. I know in rural Alaska we don't have very many opportunities and uh, we're just stuck doing really nothing and so I would say like creating like a youth center for like basketball or something just so that we have things to do instead of turning on to like drugs or um, leading on to suicide and stuff like that. White um, for youth today, with the little chance we can have, if you give us a little chance, we actually are more of more positive. If, like this, this Center for Native American Youth, it's a great center. For me, I had with my choices I made. Um, I've gone, I've gone to uh, hold up. Um, let's see. Um, Yeah, what um, what Tessa just said. If give us a little chance, we've we can. If um, <laughs> while you're thinking Sorry. about that, though, if there are if there are youth centers, <laughs> youth centers with boys and girls clubs and act activities, th those are keys, I think, because what I have found on reservations is people say, you kids say, there's nothing to do. There's nothing to do. If you've got a youth center on a reservation that's a really good youth center with organized activities, all of a sudden there's something to do. And that's a big, big difference. Do you agree? Yeah. Kevin. Thank you, Senator. And I would have to say um, from all of my partners in the government, we are so glad to have someone taking on this issue. You know, the story of Indian country is one of really tragedy, for sure, but also resilience. And these are great examples of resilience. Human beings who have overcome individual tragedies mm -hmm. and been able to move forward. And that's, um, we have to focus on that part of the story because that's one of the things uh, Indian institutions and Indian people have been so successful at. Um, I've, 
I dare say you've inspired all of us today with your um, stories. And I know that you've sort of inspired Senator Dorgan as well. He could be on a golf course or something these days, but instead, <laughs> instead he's continuing to work on solving the serious problems that face Indian country. And so we are very grateful to have that. We in government are working hard on these issues. Dr. Rubido and I met last week, and Hillary Tompkins and I are very close, and we talk about these issues. But we really need the kind of ideas that can come from outside the government and then the kind of initiatives that can come from outside the government and having the Aspen Institute, which is so prestigious and so known for big ideas, focused on these issues. Um, well, we're grateful that you focused the Aspen Institute on these very, very important issues. So thank you, Senator Dorgan. Thank you very much. Um, Yes, we'll, and we'll work in. If, uh, we'd love, Yvette, if you have a word, and, and, and uh, Hillary. But yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Alicia Gord. Um, I have a question for White Sun. Um, listening to your story and how you got back to your traditions and how that really helped you become a better leader for your community. Oftentimes, young leaders, we often go off, pursue education, pursue opportunities that are going to help us to become and develop better Native American leaders. And I'm wondering, how are you going to stay connected to your culture when you go off and do that? Um, with environmental studies is actually, it plays a big part in our Native, in our native tradition and teachings. Environmental, um, I might want to, after I complete high school, I want to go and uh, get a major in environmental studies. And with environmental studies, that helps, it ties in with our culture because our environment, we live in a rural area, which is, um, we don't live like Pueblos in stacked upon, <laughs> stacked upon of each other. We are actually spaced apart. So our environment around us is actually a key to our tradition. And I want to help preserve our forests. We've been joined, by the way, by Lillian Sparks, who is the uh, uh, Administration's Commission on Indian Issues. Thank you for your work as well, Lillian, if you have anything you want to contribute. You're welcome. Uh, other comments from the audience or questions? Yes, sir. Hi. My name is Rudy Soto. question I have for you all is uh, who are your heroes and or role models? Um, you know, I think it's always good to know, you know who you want to you know, emulate in the future and, and be like? That was a good question, I think, for, for youth leaders. Yeah, um, my role model would probably be our very own Chief, Chief uh, Manolito. He was open-minded. He always, he thought what, he always listened to what people thought and what people said. And he took that in consideration and, um, making him a better leader and helping others? Well, my support system was definitely, or is definitely my uh, inspiration to definitely move on. My mom especially, she helped me through everything and every time I traveled, she would be my, um, my right hand man, I guess. <laughs> and she would travel to places with me and just make sure that you know, I'm representing the culture, right? And I'm um, bringing forth my best effort, I guess. And also, Erin Bailey, she's definitely one of my inspirations. <laughs> yeah. That makes Erin feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we'll talk about Erin at the end of this. <laughs> Patty, obviously your mother is a unbelievable inspiration to you, but uh, outside of that, what, what, what inspires you? What kind of uh, leadership inspires you? I, I am a, because we were very poor growing up, uh, we didn't have the toys and such, so my mother would buy the uh, little golden books, and uh, back then they were a nickel, right? Okay, so I am old, <laughs> officially. <laughs> And I read all these books, and the library was my friend, and reading biographies. I love reading biographies about, you know, from people who have made it, who are successful, however you define that, and learning from them what have they overcome, how have they overcome. And I have really enjoyed it. And one of, one of the books I brought with me was uh, the Walter Isaacson's story on Steve Jobs. <laughs> so that's the latest one I'm reading. But, um, you know, really looking at uh, people who are, uh, who are sharing their life story, 
how did they overcome whatever obstacles they had? And um, so I enjoy these stories and learning from a lot of different people, you know, worldwide. So, yes, my mother, but a lot, and there are personally my own uh, mentors I go to uh, for journalism uh, who help me, lead me, guide me, and um, for native issues, uh, a lot of our traditional uh, leaders and um, people who I talk with, and our, among our people, our uncles are very good. They're the ones who discipline us. They're the one, not your parents, your mother's brothers are the ones who discipline you. And so my uncle, which is uh, uh, my niece's grandfather, is one of those role models for me and is very strong in guiding me in the culture and um, talking to me and keeping me connected to the culture. I did a, a, a documentary about gangs in Indian country years ago. And that was one of the things they found was that if they brought in a cultural element, brought the youth to the drum, brought the youth to a meeting point where they could then learn songs, have a, you know, learn how to make a drum, and do all of these culturally related things because the family structure had broken down. So the people who should have been teaching them these kinds of cultural um, <clears throat> stories and songs, they weren't doing that. So they had like their version of Boys and Girls Club, but this is what they did. And when they brought that drum back in and they brought the youth back to the circle to teach them in language, songs, and prayers, that sustained them and that brought them back and helped them make uh, a better decision about their life. So, good role model Thank question. You, Patty. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, way in the back. During the uh, <coughs> presidential elections, the political pundits often talked about the Hispanic vote, the black vote, but rarely were Native Americans and Asians mentioned. I just wondered what level of participation uh, in your areas did Native Americans have in the presidential election race, and what can be done to help increase more participation, especially among young Native Americans? Oh, let me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 Only because I covered the elections from a native perspective and, um, and youth. So it is important that we not just get out the native vote, but then the next step is, hey, get to the polls, whether it's early balloting or, or whether it's actually going to the polls on the day of. So I, I ran across families, and I was at both the Democratic and also the Republican headquarters, and uh, watching the returns and talking to the people there, you know, for whichever candidate they were um, uh, supporting. And I came across a mother whose two kids, uh, a Navajo, no, she, she was um, uh, two other tribes, the Northwest tribe and um, California tribe, Yurok and I forget her other tribe. And um, her husband was Navajo. And so they had these two boys, an 11-year-old and a 15-year-old. And those two little boys knew the candidates, knew the issues. They had even been to the Democratic National Convention. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't even go to that. Um, they knew the issues, and they were being raised by families who were showing them why it's important to participate in our political process. In Arizona, um, during the night, as the returns came in, it, uh, where Arizona's very much a red state, but it started turning pink for a while as the blue votes came in. And in at least one race, which was Ann Kirkpatrick, uh, the legislative district race in the northern, Oh, actually, it's the biggest district now in the state of Arizona after redistricting. Uh, it was the Navajo vote that put her into office, and um, after they counted all the provisional votes. When I talk to young people, I, was, I talk to them about participating at that level, whether it's you know, your county officials, your state officials, and certainly your U.S. Uh, Senate, House of Representatives uh, level, because what happens after that? Who are the people who come to the table to make the choices? And what does the Supreme Court mean to Indian country? I don't think that a lot of youth understand that, but getting that message out and talking to them. So the political vote um, has turned the tide. And it made a, a difference in races in Montana and also, um, what was the other state? Um, uh, North Dakota, yes. And so here you know, we're looking at the native vote and how uh, it can turn elections even if we are a small um, group of people, a group of voters. And as for the Asian journalists, I belong to Unity. Uh, it's a coalition of journalists 
black, Asian, Native American, and uh, gays and lesbians, and the uh, black journalists were also a part of our group for a number of years. And so looking at, again, how our populations are uh, following elections, participating in elections, and how they understand elections. So it's interesting when you look at that, you know, what is your part in the election process? And how many of you actually go down and watch the returns on election night? It's a good party to go to. <laughs> Highly recommend it. So this is my first year voting, and um, it was a really good experience. But I, I was watching the votes come in this, um, this past election, and I was sitting there. We already knew who the winner was. And then after he gave his speech, Alaska's votes came in. So they're like, and Alaska's votes go to, and I was just like, there's no point, but anyways, <laughs> but anyways, um, I really think going to your question that we need to educate the youth on what the elections are and like what what they stand for and what their views are because I know a lot of my friends didn't vote because they didn't know who to vote for and what they were really standing for and so I think that uh, really going out there and teaching the youth about what the political system is then. That's where it all starts. Good. Congratulations <laughs> on your first vote. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Were you old enough to vote this one? No, I'm 17, but I followed politics. <laughs> um, New Mexico was or is a blue state, and in our native community, um, we we need to improve on our voting because, as I saw, we didn't have. Our, some of our community members don't have TVs or running water or even electricity. So in our area, what could have been, been approved was more campaigning. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to watch television commercials then in some areas. <laughs> <laughs> That's an advantage, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to add something. But I yeah, Allison, why don't you With Tessa's up? remark about Alaska, because I could totally recognize how <laughs> she'd feel that way, especially since it's the first time she voted. But in the last election, when S Senator Lisa Murkowski was mm. running for re-election and oh, lost yeah. in the primary to somebody who was much more conservative, she decided to run on her own. And as most of, you know, some of us in the room know, she went to the Alaskan natives who yeah. came out in droves for her. And that was so critical, I think, for all natives because not only did it get somebody who really cares about Native American issues back in the Senate, you know, I know she's a member of the board and it has become even more you know, invigorated to fight for Native American issues. So I mean, just on the election issue, sometimes we think about it in terms of the presidency, mm -hmm. but getting people, who, in, getting people in office, like for, former Senator Byron Dorgan, but also Martin Heinrich, who you know, won election in the Senate, re-electing John Tester, Lisa Murkowski, all of them give credit to the Native American vote, and, and they become the champions for, for our issues, and making sure that our federal agency partners have the funding that they need and resources to do their job as well either. So sometimes I think when you're young, you only think about the presidential race, and it's always so much more than that. In Ala New Mexico, actually almost went red a couple times, yeah. and so it's important. Oh, I'm being partisan, but um, <laughs> sorry, not, not, it's just important to have people who really <coughs> champion Native American issues in office. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll we'll save Alice. that the record that way. <laughs> uh, uh, let me just, uh, we're going to wrap this up in a, in a, a couple of minutes, but I want uh, Charles, uh, excuse me, Daryl Conquering Bear, I think, had a question about, uh, the issue of, uh, of boarding schools and uh, foster care and so on. Daryl, where are you? Uh, my name is Daryl Conkering Bear from Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Um, not so much about the question, but the concern for that, the forgotten population of kids that are in foster care. Um, there's a big, huge number, but that population of Native American kids, as you can tell from why his son is here, he went back to his culture. He went back to that circle, and look at the man, young man that he is. What about those kids that are in foster care that don't get that opportunity, that lose, the, that lose their culture because of the, the, the homes that they, non-native homes that are there? ICWA, the law that is supposed to be there to help us, um, that's not being complied. And so, you know, coming from the foster care system, coming from that, that population, we're being forgotten. Um, and we're here sitting, you know, some great leaders here that understand that culture is, is important. Being able to have that preservation 
you know. And so, you know, having a center for Native American youth, you know, let's look at child welfare for those kids that are aging out of foster care, those 47 kids that are entering care this hour. You know, one or two of them could be Native American. What are we going to do to help them keep that, that culture connected? Uh, we exited out of foster care to a world of uncertainty. We don't have IHS. And if we do, they can't help us with our teeth. They can't help us with health. But, you know, we got the Medicaid because of the new Obamacare. And so, but, you know, and also providing different internships that are out there. You guys, the Udall internship, the WINS internship that are out there. Tom Udall that sits on the Senate of Indian Affairs. Great, great man out there. Um, this past summer, I got the opportunity to sit with Tim Johnson and intern for him. And, you know, put that buzz in that spark. Give us a chance. You know, don't let no Native American children get left behind. Um, and so f don't forget about the children that are in foster care. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let me just say that you, you're, you've touched on an issue that's so important. We haven't discussed it here, but the foster care issue is really, really critically important. And, and we've not gotten it right. We just haven't. We've got lots of problems out there. Patty? That was one of uh, such an emotional show I, I, I produced on radio about um, foster care and how important that law was because of the history behind ICWA that you know that created the law in the beginning. But then we had a caller from Alaska who said, "Well, where are the native people stepping up to take these native kids? And if we don't have the native people to step up." to take these kids, then what good is that law? We're only hurting our kids because they stay in the foster care system. So after that, the phone lines went dead. <laughs> Nobody wanted to talk about that because it, those are hard, you know, it is a lot to consider. And I produced a video for Arizona's adoption to aid, uh, <coughs> adoption for special needs kids. Native American children were in that population, then not because, only because they were Native American. They were special needs. So it was everything I could do to produce a video to say, look, these are some of the kids who are waiting for homes to you know, go into. But, and hopefully we generated some interest for people to come and if not adopt, then be foster parents and, and commit to that child until they're 18 years old and commit to not only children but siblings because they're always the kids, the brothers and sisters are separated out. And so I'm glad you raised that question because that's something we have to face. We have to look at how we're going to go forward with this law and how are we going to inspire Indian parents to step up to the plate. The, a the issue of aging out of foster care is another important issue because, you know, they turn 18 and you get, you know, a couple of bucks and you're out on the road. You know, that, there you go. Make a living. It is horrible how that uh, um, is handled. And there are some agencies. I work with a group um, in Phoenix and they do help youth, a lot of urban Indian youth uh, help them transition. So, you know, quite often they're at poverty level, so they have, they qualify for housing and such, and they have um, uh, services there to help them out. So, again, those pockets of help, hope, and opportunity. But thank you for raising that. I want to, um, especially, I'm just looking here and thinking, uh, uh, Kevin, the Assistant Secretary, has other things he could do today, and I'm sure he's busy, and uh, Lillian and uh, Hillary and Yvette, you run a big organization. It is really, you know, and, and all of you are busy, but it, it really is, uh, it, it feels good to me that you have taken time, this is a nonprofit organization, this is not part of your daily duties, but for you to come here I think reinforces your interest and your passion, the work you do every day for Indian kids. I, I just I really appreciate the fact that you've done that today. It, it means a lot to me that, that you've come. And to others of you in this room, I think this is, this is the first chapter of a special program we're doing in the Center for Native American Youth. We'll be continuing to do a, a lot of other things, including the youth summits on reservations. And, uh, you know, we, we, we gather, I think, on a quarterly basis or so in this room the people from federal agencies, they've all been here uh, because, the, and, and they've been wonderful to come and, and really be interested in trying to understand what are the other federal agencies doing that together we might do better. Because we do have a lot of stovepipes in government. One agency has this program, another way over here has that program, 
and very often they don't really recognize that that they're doing these programs and could do them probably better together. So we're doing a lot of those things at the center, but this uh, today is about Champions for Change. And you will, I think, go to our website and I hope come to another gathering at some point and perhaps a gathering at the White House because the White House has agreed to host us when we bring in these new Champions for Change that we honor each year. Uh, you'll help us get uh, inspiration, not just in our hearts, but uh, to the hearts of all Americans about what some really remarkable young people are doing. Now, I didn't tell her I was going to do this, but I want to finish by asking Aaron to say a word because Aaron <laughs> helped create this program out of whole cloth. It was simply, this was simply an idea. And, and uh, I provided some money. Aaron provided <laughs> all of the work. The, <laughs> but, but with the first donation, uh, we, the two of us, created an organization and... Uh, uh, I, I couldn't be more proud of what we're doing, and a lot of it has to do with uh, the person who said that she would be willing to be the director. Erin, do you want to close this sure. by saying a few words? I would really want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, when Senator Dorgan and I were talking about this event today, we were talking about a few media pieces that we touched on today, a Diane Sawyer piece, a New York Times story. And as we work at the center to shine a national spotlight on these issues, we really felt like we needed to tell the other side of the story. We needed to, along the way, make sure that as we were raising awareness, we were holding kids up that we met in our travels and roundtables with kids from more than 150 tribes at this point to say, here is this youth that's doing this really, really awesome, inspiring thing. And I think I speak on behalf of our entire team when I say that they absolutely inspire us to work crazy hours and be excited to be here every day. So thank you so much for being a part of that. Um, I hope you will stay connected with us. We really want these events to be uh, an opportunity to drive new stakeholders and new resources to the table um, to benefit Native kids. So thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. And thank you to Senator Dorgan for, for leading the charge and, and supporting all of us. And go to our website, Center for Native American Youth. Uh, stay connected to us and uh, pick up the phone and call us if you, if you see things we can do. I mean, I come home from these trips and I always have a story to tell my wife about, you have no idea who I met. And I tell this story that has lifted me up once again and made me believe that what we're doing is worth it and making a difference. So uh, you share those stories with us as well. In fact, there's a place on our website specifically for that. So thank you all very much for coming. God bless you. I appreciate it.